Product and Company Pivots, prepared for and presented at the 2019 Square One Entrepreneurship Training Program. Square One is a program of the Center for Emerging Technologies. CET is an affiliate of the Cortex Innovation Community. Square One is funded in part by the Missouri Technology Corporation. I appreciate everybody's time. Um, as you said, I am an alumni of the Square One program. I was in the fall 2016 cohort, I think. Uh, time has flown. Uh, my hair is much grayer than it was then. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so today what I was going to do, just to give you, you guys a, a quick overview, so as you know, today I'm going to be talking about pivots. Um, so, so what happens when you decide that it's time for something in your company to change, whether it's your product uh, or whether it's just the, the overall purpose of your company. There are many different reasons that can come up, um, but I'm really going to walk you guys through what my company was uh, for about a year and a half why we decided at a certain point that something had to change. Um, you know, as you'll learn, it's you pivot or die is, is kind of the motto. Uh, and then how did we go about that process of figuring out what, what should we be doing? You know, if, if we want to not just survive, but also scale, make a ton of money, all, all that great stuff you're trying to do as a, as a, a high growth tech startup, how do you work through that process and how do you work through that process quickly? Uh, and then what are we doing today? You know, and how did we know that, okay, we, we've actually struck on the thing that this is what we're going to continue with moving forward. Um, this is the thing that we think could win for us. And that's not to say that thing could change again in the future. Um, I don't know how many of you get, so I guess just to give me a sense of, of the crowd, um, how many people in here are, would you say, are working on kind of traditional small business, you know, you're going to be bootstrapping it yourself, maybe a bank loan, something to that uh, situation, maybe? Okay. And how many people in here, I know when I was doing this, there were some people who were doing like consulting type companies. Anybody this year, maybe? Yeah, one. And then who's doing like high, you know, high growth kind of tech startup, at least that's, that's what you have in mind. Okay, so pretty, pretty even split. Um, so today, so I, I, I say that uh, just to caveat that today, everything I tell you, so, so my experience is through the lens of, you know, high growth technology startup, right? And so part of it is we want to grow as quickly as possible. Within five to 10 years, we want to raise tens of millions of dollars of private financing so that we can either have the company bought or have a public offering for the company. And so the decisions that we make are always through that lens. And so I, I just want to be clear on that because if you're a small business kind of going through the traditional, maybe you take out a bank loan, a business loan, it, it functions a little differently. And so I would just take, take what I say with a grain of salt if you are in that other situation. So what I'll do briefly is run through my background just to give you guys a sense of, of who the heck is this guy. Um, I will walk through my experience on the first iteration of my company. So my first iteration of my company was Dynamic Surgical. We were a medical device company working in the ear, nose, and throat space. Um, both myself and my co-founder came out of Wash U. I'm an engineer by trade, um, so I'm a biomedical engineer. I have a PhD in that from Wash U. Um, he is an ear, nose, throat physician who was in his, he was just about halfway through his residency when we met. Um, I will walk you then through kind of the essentials of, you know, what the heck happened? How did we work through that pivot? Uh, and then I'll walk you through our new experience with this new iteration of the company. So resilient. So same company, just slightly different name, slightly different purpose. Um, but resilient being a, a hardware as a service company that allows doctors to do appointments over the internet. So we've basically taken telehealth and added robotics to it so that doctors can do complete appointments. So you can imagine that was a fairly large shift from the first to the second. Uh, and, and we had to do that kind of under the gun, you know, with some of our investors with knives to our throat. Um, so uh, it'll, it'll be an interesting, interesting story. So just to give you a little bit about myself. So, so pivoting is, is really kind of a core part of my being. Um, I'm a military brat. 
So I grew up moving around the country constantly. Um, so I, I put this map just to show that this was all by the time I was 20, uh, all the different places I had lived. You know, we were moving every two to four years. Um, every time we went to a new place, I had to figure it out again. And I, and I say this to say that it really taught me that change is inevitable. Change is, it's okay. Uh, and honestly, you just got to figure it out. You know, there was no excuse. Every time I moved, there was no excuse as to why I couldn't be successful where we were moving to. And I really do believe that this experience, you know, I did, what, two middle schools and three high schools, you know, within, within a few years span. Um, and I really do believe it prepared me for, for the tech startup world, uh, where every day is different, things can change on a dime, and you really just have to figure it out as it goes. So, as I mentioned, I'm an engineer. Um, so I originally did my bachelor's in biomedical engineering at Duke University. Um, I originally went there because I wanted to study prosthetics. Uh, I, I grew up, my, my teenage years were during the Iraq and Afghanistan war. So I was growing up on military bases. My, my dad is actually a dentist in the military. Um, so I grew up around kind of a, a healthcare background during wartime. And the hot topic at the time was amputees coming back. You know, what are we going to do with all these amputees? How are we going to be able to give them back function? Um, so that really, really had me interested. And so I went off to Duke to study that, randomly took a class in neuroscience and fell in love with neuroscience. Uh, and so I had to change directions. Uh, that really took me down the direction of neural engineering. And so it was kind of like marrying somewhat of the, the prosthetic space with what I had learned in the neuroscience space. So how do we take brain principles and apply them uh, in such a way that we can modify the brain to get new function. That brought me here to Wash U. Um, so I had originally moved to St. Louis when I was about 16, 17 years old. You know, was here for a year and then went away to college and then came right back for grad school. Uh, at Wash U, my background was much, much deeper into neural engineering. Um, so my lab was originally an auditory research lab where we were doing uh, what they call single unit recordings from monkeys. So we would take electrodes, stick them in monkey brains. You'd sit there with them in a booth for five hours uh, and try not to lose your mind <laughs> in the basement of all places. Um, and eventually our lab actually pivoted. So my, my PI, my, the guy that I was working under at the university, decided that he felt that that research wasn't having the impact that he wanted. Um, and he had to come explain to all of us why the lab was kind of changing direction. Um, so we ended up pivoting more into the machine learning space. Um, we were using machine learning and artificial intelligence um, to do a lot of decoding for brain science. And so the main project in the lab was developing an algorithm so that you could do auditory testing on someone. So I know you guys have all probably done the tone. You know, raise your hand if you hear this tone. And so he basically automated that test with machine learning. Uh, my project, I ended up spearheading a collaboration uh, with a, a spinal cord injury lab. Um, really about that time, I realized that academia was not for me. Um, a lot of grant writing at the time. Uh, interestingly enough, I thought that I was getting away from grant writing, and then I started a company and basically do the same thing now. Uh, so, uh, joke's on me, I guess. But... Um, Probably about halfway through, I got some exposure to the startup world through some of my professors. Um, I had the opportunity to work part-time uh, at one of my professors' company that had, at the time, raised about $5 million of VC funding. Um, and so I spent about a year and a half doing con technology consulting work for his company and realized, holy crap, like startups, this is for me, this is what I need to be doing. So everything I did after that was geared towards startups. How do I get into this space? Um, so out of that, I ended up starting a company with a, a couple friends of mine from school, and this actually came out of a, a school program at Wash U called, now it is called Sling Health. At the time, it was called Ideal Labs, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and we started a company called Snappies, where we were using machine learning to build a recommendation engine to recommend meal plans uh, to people. And the recommendations were also based off of the inventory at grocery stores. I thought it was a fantastic idea. Uh, <laughs> Q, Q didn't. Um, so, 
No, so uh, we, you know, we, I came into the Square One program actually with this idea. Um, so at the time, I had raised probably about ten, fifteen thousand dollars through winning a few different competitions. Definitely was feeling myself. Had some uh, some meetings with grocery store executives. Totally new experience for me as an engineer. I knew absolutely nothing about the business world. Um, came in here, and I know they preach this to you guys all the time. Their goal is basically to either convince you to pivot, move forward, or kill your company. Uh, and they killed my company. <laughs> so <laughs> luckily, at that time, I met my, who is now my co-founder, uh, Donish. Um, so Donish was an ear, nose, and throat resident at Wash U. Um, he was about three years in. Um, if you ever meet him, I, just kind of hurricane of energy. Uh, and for me, I'm a fairly like low energy guy, and so I think we balanced each other out pretty well, uh, and it's worked thus far. But he spent the next four months convincing me to come work with him on this crazy idea for a medical device. Um, after after talking to a lot of my mentors, uh, I remember talking to Q about it. You know, hey, is this guy crazy? Like, you know, should I should I actually do? It? And he was like, yeah, he's a little crazy, but you, you kind of need to be a little crazy to to win in this game. Um, so, from that point, we started uh, Dynamic Surgical. So, Dynamic Surgical was, was born out of this idea, it was actually something that he had seen while he was in his residency, that when people come in and have head and neck problems, especially if they have what might be a tumor, it takes a long time between the doctor saying, this might be a tumor, to actually getting the biopsy to decide whether or not it's cancer. Uh, at the time, it was about a three-month three month lag between those points. And in those three months, you could go, you could just step up in stages in cancer, right? And so all of a sudden, morbidity skyrockets after that three-month period. And part of the problem was that the tools that you have available to you to do it quickly are flexible. So you have what are called flexible endoscopes. Um, so think long, long, flimsy tube with a camera at the end of it. But that long, flimsy tube can't actually transmit force to take a biopsy for you. And then the tools that you normally use in the operating room, um, so rigid endoscopes, are more like, think of a, a rigid metal tool that has a camera at the end of it. But they have to put you under general anesthesia, it's, it can actually be a fairly painful uh, surgery after the fact, and it took three months because there was such a long time of waiting for the surgery. So surgery rooms were kind of backed up across the US when it came to ear, nose, and throat. So we came up with this idea of, well, what if you could turn that flexible scope into a rigid scope on demand? You know, so both of us had a background in robotics and knew that there was technology out there that was fairly miniaturizable that, well, what if we could apply this technology and come up with the idea for a sleeve that you could put over these flexible endoscopes and then when you're in the office as an ENT and you see this, you could actually press a button, it robotically rigidifies, and then you can actually take the biopsy, right? And so this was, this was the first idea that we had. So it was called flex sleeve uh, and thermablation. So, in so this was actually the first, first example of pivoting. So we had done some work on this idea. We had raised maybe like $50,000, $100,000, um, like from family and friends, and then I think maybe one doctor at the time. And when we started to talk to venture capital investors, they said, well, this is great, this technology is wonderful, but there's actually not enough biopsies to make this worthwhile. And at the time, we were like, well, that's crazy. Like, this, this would change people's lives. Like, you should really care about this mission. And they were like, you know, it's about money. <laughs> so we're, we got to make money, and so you got to figure out a way to make this more useful? How are doctors going to make more money using this device? And so that brought us to sleep apnea. Where I don't know how familiar everybody is with sleep apnea. Essentially, you choke while you're sleeping. And part of that is because your airway, especially in the back of your nose and your throat, is <coughs> collapsing. One way that people treat sleep apnea is that they use what's called RF ablation, so radio frequency ablation. They use thermal energy to shrink the size of the tissue. Um, and so usually they, they, it's like a, a long needle that they prod into the tissue, they apply the energy, and then the tissue shrinks. 
thus opening up your airway more permanently, right? But again, this was a procedure that needed to be done in the operating room under general anesthesia. And the problem is, is that when you have sleep apnea, putting you under general anesthesia actually puts you at risk of heart failure, you know, your, your lungs can stop working, all types of craziness. Um, so the idea was that, well, if I could do this procedure, again, minimally invasive surgery was something that has been on the rise over the last 10 to 15 years. If this is a procedure that we could do in the office, right, now all of a sudden this reduces the risk of something happening, something bad happening to someone who has sleep apnea. And so we came up with the idea of using the flex sleeve device with thermal energy to do that procedure in the office. Um, so where I was struggling earlier is I had a fantastic animation video that we had made and I just couldn't get it loaded. But the idea being that when a doctor is using that flexible scope, and typically flexible scope, it goes up through the nose and down the back of the throat um, in the ENT office. As they find passages along the airway where it's constricted, typically from fatty tissue, they'd be able to lock the device in place, insert the needle, and shrink the tissue with thermal energy and work their way down the airway as they see blockages. This idea seemed like it was gonna be the one for us. Um, we started to get a lot of interest from ear, nose, and throat physicians. Um, after, after we switched to this idea, we probably had four or five ear, nose, throat doctors invest in the company. You know, we, we thought this was, this was it. Um, it also looked like this technology also had applicability outside of this space. You know, we had multiple investors, people from other industries come to us and say, oh, I could use this in aerospace. You know, I could use it in, in automotive. I could use all these different spaces. And so we, we said, okay, this is what we're going to work on. We're going all in on this. Uh, then we got deeper into R&D. So our early prototypes gave us a lot of hope for this. So we were able to actually create devices where we could lock shape reversibly um, and repeatedly. It was when we started to miniaturize that things got interesting. Uh, and we got to the point where we actually worked with an outside engineering firm that was actually based out of Boston, great firm. Um, they did some great engineering work, simulation work for us. And we actually finally figured out, oh, these are the mechanisms we can use to miniaturize this technology. It's going to be great. But there was a caveat. It was going to cost way more money to develop that technology than we had originally planned for. So what originally was going to be, OK, I think we need to raise $20 million over the lifespan of this company, was quickly becoming $40 plus million plus over the lifespan of this company. right? The other thing being, in the medical device space, over the last five years or so, in early stage, funding has been kind of shrinking. Uh, there's just not as much money floating around. Uh, and so, you know, we ran into a situation where we had to ask ourselves, how, you know, is, is this the hill we want to die on, essentially? We're going to have to raise a lot more money than we had originally planned for. The funding in our space is shrinking faster than we had really anticipated. You know, I, I, both of us traveled a lot, you know, so Miami, New York, Chicago, Silicon Valley. And every time I talked to somebody and said, oh, yeah, we're in medical device, it was kind of like, oh, OK, yeah, medical device. You know, so a lot of the funding was starting to move towards the digital health space. You know, and so we're looking at those trends. We're looking at what, what our OPEX is going to look, what our operating expenses are going to look like. And we basically pumped the brakes and said, hold on we need to take a second and figure out, is this what we want to do? Are we doing the right thing? Is this company going to survive? Are we going to get a return for our investors, right? Because at least in the, the high growth technology startup space, that's the name of the game. What, what ROI are you going to get for your investors? And what is the likelihood that you're going to get that ROI? And so I, I bring that up because I, I think I, I tried to put a framework together to kind of summarize how we thought about it as we were making a decision on should we move forward with this? And if not, what the hell is next? 
I'll say the first place we started was our mission statement. I highly, highly, highly recommend that no matter what you're doing as a company, you put together a mission statement. What is it that makes you guys tick? Right? Like what, what is the higher level issue that you want your company to solve? And I would say, luckily, about three years ago, Donish forced me to sit down for like five hours. It was actually in this back room right here, because I remember it very vividly. We sat there for five hours and worked out a mission statement. Our mission statement was that we want to make healthcare more accessible to patients. It was that simple. Kind of broad, not, you know, not too specific, but it was you know, specific to healthcare. And I say that because, you know, at least for guys like us, I, we have very uh, eclectic interests. You know, I, I can be easily distracted, he can get easily distracted. There's a lot of different things that interest us. And so it was really important, looking back, that we had come up with a mission statement that limited us to healthcare. <laughs> because we definitely had ideas for, oh, we, we can take this technology, and we can go into aerospace, we can do this, we can do that. But we went back to the mission statement and we said, oh, wait a minute, yeah, 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 no, we, we care about healthcare. You know, Donish's father had actually gotten sick when we started this company. And it was part of the reason that we were working on it was that we saw the difficulties that his father had accessing care, right? And so that told us, okay, no matter what we do, let's stick to healthcare, let's stick to giving people better access because we do actually care about those things. The second issue is, was identifying what our core competency was. And so when I say core competency, what I mean by that is, what are you good at? As an individual, as a team, uh, what, what interests you as a team? You know, and so for us, we had to look at, so at the time, when we, when we stopped and took a look back, we had seven employees full time, right? And so we were just getting to the point where we were planning on scaling the team, we were identifying a, a head of sales, all these different things. And before we pulled the trigger on that, we said, hold on, we got, this is now the time to stop before we you know, end up with 20 people and then we don't know what to do with them when we change directions. So I had to look at my team of seven or so people and say, what is it that we do really, really well? And what do we not do well? So for us, we knew robotics. We knew robotics through and through. I had multiple members on my team that had extensive experience in that arena. Um, we had some people that had just enough software experience, um, but not necessarily on like the consumer side, it was more the B2B side. And so we looked at our team and said, okay, we like healthcare and access to healthcare. We know robotics really well. Let's see if we can find something that still fits within that realm uh, that, that actually market trends are pointing to that this is, this is an area where we feel comfortable that we're going to be able to raise the money that we need to win long term. You know? And so the third point was looking at market trends. So where is money flowing today? I think a lot of people, uh, a lot of people it tend to ignore that fact, but at least when you're in the, the, the tech startup space, you really do need to know where, where are investors putting their money? Is it growing? Is it shrinking? How fast is it growing? How fast is it shrinking? You know, is it just kind of a, this is a one or two year thing and then they're going to lose interest in this area? Um, and so we, we took a hard look at the market. We kept talking to our customers, you know, so we had a, a, a good 10 or so doctors that we spoke to fairly regularly. Uh, and we're asking them, you know, hey, what are you seeing on the ground? What, you know, what matters to you? What would excite you as a customer? Um, so I, I cannot stress enough, please keep talking to customers. So many people start companies and don't talk to the customers until like the very end and then you're screwed. Um, so I, I would really, really, really stress that from the beginning to the end, you are constantly talking to people who you think might be customers of your company along the way. 
Um, and it was actually in one of the conversations with one of the ENTs we knew that they said, hey, you should look at the senior space. We have a huge problem when it comes to seeing people who are transportationally disadvantaged, so they have a hard time getting to the doctor, um, especially if they, if they live in nursing homes, senior living communities, adult daycares, they need help. So look at those spaces and see if you guys can figure out how the technology you are developing, you know, there's an access problem, can, can you make it work there? And so on a dime, we started talking to as many people in the nursing home industry as we knew, uh, in the assisted living industry, you know, senior living in general, to get a sense of what, what problems are going on in this space, right? Uh, and we, we, we confirmed that the, these physicians were right. They were actually hurting in that space. I mean, you had an industry where, you know, nursing homes, their margins were shrinking. Uh, they had, you know, over a third of the residents there were going to the ER every year. You went to senior living and it really wasn't that much better. Um, a lot of times family members were having to pick people up and take them to the doctor. Um, so the onus was on family, not the facility. Uh, the staff wasn't trained to handle all the medical issues. Doctors, you know, nursing homes, you had doctors essentially would come like once a month maybe and do checkups, which just wasn't, it wasn't on demand enough for the residents there. Um, and so we said, okay, now this is, this is a space where people are hurting. Right. And that's as, as a founder and as someone that's running a company, that's what you want to see, right? Like, people who actually have a pain point uh, that needs to be solved. So as we started to identify a fairly clear pain point, we knew that doctors wanted better access to these patients. Um, they felt like the technology that we had developed, this idea of being able to, to control robotics through devices um, and do it digitally, they thought that that technology, well, why, you could use that remotely, right? It's digital. You know, I could just control the device when it's not with me, right? So that kind of hinted at the remote telehealth space. We then had to figure out, okay, how the hell do we convince our team that this is the right direction to go, right? So, so Donish and I can do all this background research, you know, till our faces turn blue, but if I can't convince my team of guys that I had that, hey, this is the direction we need to be going. I know we had just sold, <laughs> I just spent the last year and a half selling you on this other idea, and now I kinda have to pull the plug on it because of these various reasons. But this new idea, I, I, I know it's gonna be bigger than the thing that we were working on. And so full transparency uh, is the fourth one. I would say it's actually the thing that we didn't do that well, to, to be frank. I kind of wish I had had a conversation with my team earlier that we were thinking about changing directions. You know, Donish and I, because we were the ones dealing with customers and dealing with investors, we, we had a, a view that the engineers just didn't have. But until we had convinced ourselves that it was the right thing to do, we waited you know, to, to talk to everybody, to figure out, to, you know, hey, this is, this is what needs to happen. Here's why it needs to happen. Here's where we think the right way to go is. I wish I, if I could do it over again, I wish I had let my, my engineers in on that process earlier. I, I think they would have had a ton of great feedback. They may have identified problems that we just weren't seeing because they were working on the ground level. You know, they, they had, again, we had one view, they had a different point of view, and their point of view was just as valid, right? And so I, I cannot stress enough how important full transparency is uh, if you're trying to make a decision on whether or not to pivot, especially, especially if you have employees, if you have, sure as hell, if you have investors. Um, you know, that's another thing that I think we you know, we were, we were clear with our investors, but I think I'd wish, I wish we were clearer earlier because um, it would have saved me some strife and some very, very long, painful phone calls. 
uh, had I, had, you know, had we had been talking to them a little bit more along the way, they would have seen the world through our eyes, right? Um, and I, I did not give them the opportunity to see the world through my eyes until I was personally clear on what was in front of me. And then lastly, moving really, really fast. Um, this is something that, honestly, it's, it's even kind of hard to explain. I think every company is a little bit different. You know, being in the hardware space, things just move slower than software inherently. Um, the iteration cycles are much longer. Um, so you have to be more creative uh, as you're working through ideas to prove them to yourself that, okay, this is the right way to go. I think my customers really want this. Um, but at least for us as a company, as a company that had raised capital, every single day you're burning through money. Uh, and the closer and closer you get to the end of that money trail, the closer and closer you are to having to now have to go convince somebody else to give you more money, right? Especially as a, pre, a pre-revenue hardware business, that's what keeps us alive, right? If you're, if you're a business that has customers, you know, maybe, maybe you have enough revenue, right? Where that revenue can keep you alive while you're figuring things out. But when you're pre-revenue, um, you, you have to move quickly. Uh, or else, I mean, that really can, that can be what kills you uh, in the end. So I, I want to pause here for a second um, and see, one, are there any questions that anybody has? I'm, I'm happy to answer anything, just about anything. Um, <laughs> and then, two, oh, yep. Yeah. Well, and then two, I was curious, you know, because I, I really do believe, like, of, of all of these, for us at least, and I, and I feel like for everybody, the most important thing for us was the mission statement. Because it really did kind of put a peg in the ground and kind of put a bit of a fence up as we were exploring. You know, and I think if we didn't have that fence when we were exploring, we, we would have died along the way. It, there was just no way uh, we would have made it through this pivot. Um, so I wanted to hear if, if anybody wants to volunteer, I'm kind of curious to see, does anybody have a mission statement for their organization? Uh, and are they willing to share that mission statement with uh, the rest of your classmates? So, I'm yes, sir. Here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So just to some, just in case people couldn't hear in the back, um, the question is, you know, in the in the healthcare space, the buy the person who's purchasing in many cases is not the person who's actually using it, right? And so it makes healthcare really really difficult when you're trying to figure out is this the right thing to be working on and who the hell is going to pay for it. Right. And so how do you, you know, what were some of my experiences and kind of working through that struggle? Um, it was painful, <laughs> to say the least. Um, so, you know, for those that don't know healthcare today, you can have there are some things that patients are willing to pay for. Right. And so you have kind of consumer focused applications that maybe you as a patient want to pay for it to help you, I don't know, consolidate your records, for example. Um, you could have doctors pay for something, right? So many doctors, doctors can work kind of in two, I think of it as two settings. You kind of have your private practice setting where you're basically a small business owner as a physician, or you have the hospital setting where you are an employee. Um, two very different customer bases. And that was, I would say, first off, that was one thing that I think really got cemented home for me was that in talking this through with private practice physicians versus hospitalists, it was a completely different conversation and they each had different kind of incentive structures that they were working through. Um, 
And then I guess the final is kind of the, the insurance company, you know? And so what I would say is for us, we always kind of started with insurance and kind of worked our way down because I feel just generally speaking, they're the ones that kind of sent, set the incentive structure in healthcare. And then it kind of trickles down from there. So even if you want a physician to buy something, you then have to ask, how are they getting reimbursed for doing this thing in the first place from the insurance company? Um, so everything we did, if we thought that it had a value proposition for the physician, we had to say, okay, is this a procedure that the physician is going to get paid by insurance for? Um, you know, are the, what, are the, what are the quality requirements around this thing? What's the regulatory requirements around it? Um, and so I, I don't know, for, for me personally, that was the easiest way to work through it was kind of start, start at the top of the value chain and then just kind of work your way down. So for us personally, and as I'll get to it in a second as I kind of describe what we're working on now, it took a while to get there, but we realized that, oh, the physicians are willing to pay for this. As long, as long as they know they're getting reimbursed to do this, they are totally willing to pay. And honestly, the only way I, we figured that out was talking to the physician, um, talking to them. And he was literally just kind of shooting our shot. It was just like, hey, if, if I charged you $50 for this, would you do it? You know, what about $100? Would you still do it? What, and so even if we didn't know they would pay, it didn't hurt that. And it was actually something that we actually overlooked at first. We completely set aside looking at physicians to pay for it. Because having been through that before with the medical device, getting physicians to pay for stuff is not easy. Um, but then when we finally asked, we realized, oh wow, no, they're, they're not, not just are they willing to pay, they're actually willing to pay a fairly good sum of money to do this. Rather than having to work through, you know, the hospital or the insurance company or or nursing homes, you know, all those things have really, really long sales cycles. And that's the other part of it too, is how long is the sales cycle for each stakeholder that you're pitching to? You know, a hospital from point of contact to them signing a contract can be nine plus months. And that's fast. Um, whereas an individual physician practice, you know, you, you can get three months if you're, if you're you know, if you, if you have a good rapport with them that sales cycle can come down a lot. And so that was a big factor for us. So question like working, working with an outside firm that's going to do some form of contract prototyping for you, you know, how do you manage that? Do you go visit? Like how, do, how does that work? Um, so we did, we used a couple outside, maybe one, two, three outside firms for some of the work we were doing on the medical device. Um, one of them, we actually did a site visit because they were actually doing, like actually putting together devices for us. And so we wanted to see like, what did, the, what did their facility look like? You know, do they actually have a clean room? You know, so there's, because they're actually physically doing something, you definitely want, if you can, to go see what it even looks like there. Um, and all these firms were actually in Boston for us. Um, the other two firms were doing simulation work for us. So it was all computer based work. So doing a site visit wasn't really going to add value for us. Um, all of it was conferencing calls. So conference calls, video conferencing, um, and whenever you work with an outside firm, whether it's hardware, software, whatever, you just want to make sure that you have, you know, regularly set up meetings. At the beginning of the project, you want crystal clear deliverables on what they're going to provide you at the end. I cannot stress that enough because you will end up arguing about that at the end. Um, so you want to make sure that they give you what they said they were going to give you. You want to make sure there's a regular meeting schedule. Um, and then you just want to make sure that um, like IP agreements and indemnity, you know, like who's liable if something goes wrong in the future, that you just have all those things worked out before you interface with them. At least that was, that was our experience. Do you, in terms of how much is this cost, is it something new that also you see 
how confident does it get or could it give you a approximate you know amount that it's going to charge you to five thousand or ten thousand dollar to be able to yeah, no, definitely. So there's different types of arrangements you can use. So you have arrangements where it's all, you know, it's a clear cost up front. Um, you have arrangements where it's just hourly, essentially, and then however many hours it takes, that's what it costs. Some will be like 25% up front, the rest at the end, 50% up front, the rest at the end. It, it varies. It's flexible. Um, and I guess for the sake of time, I'll keep moving through it. Um, but on that, that's a, those are good questions. So on that note, I wanted to walk a little bit through how we kind of move, how we prototyped our way through this process to figure out where we are today. So as I mentioned, you know, we realized like nursing homes, senior living had a problem getting access to doctors. We had specialist physicians that thought that, you know, remote, remote technology, the ability to do basic procedures remotely would be huge for them. So doing an endoscopy remotely added a lot of value in terms of screening a patient, right? And so for us, we had to figure out, okay, how do we test this idea to see, like, is this an actually viable thing for the physician? So we said, what is the easiest way we can put together an experience that the physician can have to tell us that we're on the right track or we are just completely off base? And so what we did was, this was actually our very first prototype after the pivot where what we had developed was we basically had uh, a flexible endoscope that was robotically controlled where all the robotics was based here uh, in this control box. Super low tech, I mean, 3D printing, you know, fairly cheap motors that we had bought from Germany or I can't even remember where they were from. Um, that was like a whole ordeal. <laughs> but um, the idea was that you could actually, the doctor remotely could actually move the tip of the endoscope using a touchscreen interface, right? While they could actually see what was happening on the other end. Um, All together, this prototype probably cost us, I mean, maybe a few hundred dollars at most. So it was fairly inexpensive, super low tech, but it was like, I just want to give them the basic experience and see, does this even make sense for them? And so in doing so, what I've done here is put together a GIF. So the doctor is able to use a touch screen and their movements on the touch screen are actually moving the tip, right? And so we actually tested this with doctors and they said, oh my God, like I've, I've actually never had this ability before. I've never seen through an endoscope this large. I, I like this experience, right? And so that was, okay, good, good first sign. But when it came to the business model, we realized, well, I don't know how feasible this business model is, right? You, you have this one device, like who the hell is we selling this to? Like who's, who's buying, you know, can I get a nursing home to buy this? Is the doctor gonna pay for this? So what we ended up finding out was that, you know, having one, having one device actually didn't add much value to anybody because these patients see all types of doctors, right? And so to have value for those individuals, you have to have more than one device and then you also have to have some sort of some sort of station that it's all based on for that to make sense if you're going to have a suite of devices they can't be individual they actually have to have like a station associated with them and so that came to our second prototype again super super low tech so these are two of our engineers uh, mohit and alex and what we realized was that there had to be like a base station So this was a mobile robot where on this screen, the patient could actually see the physician. They could actually see family members who had video conferenced in, but the physician actually has the ability to control the camera up top so that they can actually see everything that's going on in front of them. And so the thought was is that, so if you have this base station that's robotically controlled, you could then have devices that were actually attached. And so that's what Alex was actually working on in here where we had uh, devices that were USB enabled that were actually connected to this uh, station. And so you could swap out devices as needed. You would have a nurse on the end where the patient was and the doctor was remote. And so here again was a, a GIF of a doctor using this station, right? So me, the patient, uh, they're able to now control their view of the patient. 
and use the exact same interface that they had used for that device that I had shown you previously, right? So you have the same, same experience, but you're able to kind of switch between views, switch between devices. In doing testing with a handful of physicians, again, they said, visually, this is fantastic. It's great that I can control it, but it's taking too long. Like, I feel like my appointments are gonna take forever. You know, when you guys are like fumbling with the devices and, and switching them out and pulling them out, like they're like, that's just not normally how that works in my day-to-day -day workflow. You know, so like, I, I, what, they were like, I want to control this. Like, you're already giving me some level of control. I, give me more control over this process. And so again, we took a step back, we did some more research, and we found uh, a particular field called collaborative robotics, where in manufacturing, it was actually becoming very common to have very lightweight robotic arms, where workers on the floor were actually able to work closely with those arms to do small tasks, right? And it actually speeds up tasks. There's a lot of studies coming out of MIT right now that it actually makes tasks you know, 20 to 50% faster if you're doing it with these collaborative robots compared to by yourself. And so we said, well, let's incorporate that technology into what we're doing, right? We actually give the doctor the ability to actually control some aspects of this exam remotely with assistance of a medical assistant or a nurse where the patient is. And so what we did is we, we reached out to, we actually found a collaborative robotic company based out of Canada uh, called Canova that already had FDA approved arms. And essentially the idea was that by putting these arms on a mobile base with the help of a nurse, the physician can actually control the positioning of the devices themselves remotely. And so they didn't need that person as much where the patient was. And so they had more control over this examination. And that's actually what brought us to where we are today at Resilient, where you have a doctor remotely using a touchscreen interface to actually communicate and examine patients where they are in the community using, using mobile robots. When we finally got to here, all of a sudden everything changed. Doctors started returning our calls when we, when we started talking to them. You know, investors started taking meetings with us. Uh, senior living facilities wanted to talk. And so all of a sudden the ball started rolling. So, so that told us, okay, I, I think we're hitting on the thing that we can actually potentially take the distance. Um, and so from that point, I would say that was probably, I don't know, March, March or so of this year. And since then, it's been totally working all in on the product development process for this specific technology, right? And so right now we have a plan launch for March of next year. Um, we have manufacturing partners identified we, we have our, our software architecture laid out. And so things are actually moving forward and we're actually at the point right now where next week we should get our first, our first signed physician. And so in working through the business model, we realize that because physicians now can get reimbursed by insurance companies for doing these remote visits, they're actually willing to pay for this ability. You know, and so we found that physicians are willing to pay $50 per visit to do this with each visit with, with a single patient, right? And so we have uh, a 30 plus physician practice in Chicago right now that we're expecting a signature from next week. And with that, we can then take that and potentially go raise some more money to actually allow us to scale, get into the market, iterate further to get to product market fit. And so I say all that to show you guys kind of the, the, full, the full process of the different steps that we took along the way, you know, coming from a medical device company to now being a hardware as a service company, um, a lot has changed. But along the way, we use basically the same exact process in short, short spurts, you know, testing ideas, talking to the customer, keeping up with market trends, making sure that we had a good line of communication amongst our team members. Um, and, and then once you know, you, once you're, once you start to get that traction, once you start to get interest, you then kind of double down, right? And then you start to put most of your effort 
narrower and narrower into what you're working on. Um, so, so with that, I will pause there, uh, really stop there. Um, are there any questions? Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, you're drawing down on money paid salaries and whatnot. Your initial investors, uh, how have they responded to what they thought they mm -hmm. were getting when they first contributed? And then to see you rapidly pivoting and changing and Mm -hmm. then did they stay on board? What, what yeah, so I would say when we first stopped to pivot, we had probably raised, I uh, raised maybe about 600000 at that time. Um, and that was probably spread across, I don't know, 12 or so investors. Um, all those investors have stayed on. Uh, we've added some investors since then. So, so to date, we've now raised about 1.2 million. Um, what I would say is that I, I definitely learned a lot about how to communicate with investors. So, so in the end, an investor wants a return. I mean, that, that's really what it boils down to. And what I'd say is that early stage companies, they're investing in you as a person and not the idea. And I think, it, I think that makes it easier um, they, I would say mo most savvy investors know that things are going to change somehow, some way. I don't know exactly how, but things are going to change. Um, and so I think the fact that we kept an open line of communication, um, we made very clear why we were changing direction and, and which, you know, which direction we're going. It looked like it was a big market. It actually looked like uh, the market for this is actually much larger than the market for the medical device we were working on. And so I think all of that together made it so that they've actually been very receptive and have actually been more helpful since then. Um, I found that we actually have a group of more engaged investors because I would say myself and Donish changed how we were communicating with them. We should have been communicating with them, I think, from the beginning that way. But it took the pivot to really get us to that point where we figured out, like, okay, this is the cadence. I need to be talking to them once a month. This is the type of information I need to be giving them. And when we got really good at that, all of a sudden you get random phone calls of like, hey, I know this guy, you know, he can help. Or, hey, I know this person, they, they can help you with this other thing. And I, it, it's been a completely different experience post pivot. Um, so I, I think communication is really the, the big one. Yes. So you're saying like, what's the valuation? Yeah, exactly. Oh, so we, so we raise all of our money off of convertible debt. Okay. Um, so you don't really have to set a valuation. You set, so you'll set a valuation cap, which is your valuation in the future, essentially, but not your valuation today. Mm -hmm. right. Some small, some, right. yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, same. So that was yeah. That's a good, actually a very good question. So so I've had a lot of people ask me that. Oh, are you say are you the same corporate entity? Right. And the answer is yes. Um, we just filed a, a doing business as so that we could market as a different name, but it's still the same C corp based in Delaware. Um, and a big part of that is your investors. I'm sure would throw a fit <laughs> if if you like close one company and then try to yeah. yeah I, I didn't even want to touch that. You said you partnered with a company in Canada. Did you set a merger or a merger? No, so the company that actually makes the robotic arms just happens to be based in Montreal. Um, so they were, they were a startup at one point in time that has since raised a lot of money. Um, they had an FDA approved you know, piece of hardware, so we didn't really have to change anything with it. Um, and it really was in the form of a partnership. So there, yeah, there are different ways you can approach that. Um, some people create joint entities to work on stuff. Some people treat them as you know, OEMs, and so they're basically just a contract manufacturer. Um, so for right now, they do contract work for us. But I think in the future, there's going to be some opportunities to have like a much more you know, uh, together type of relationship, definitely.
Yes, sir. Uh, first of all, you're a professor of doctor at Princeton. Mm-hmm. So did you think it was more helpful to have professors that were subject matter experts to an extent that you could get their opinion and they're invested in your company, company obviously? Yeah. I, there are pros and cons. So I would say that like having someone who's a domain expert is great. I think you want to find domain experts if you can find them. Whether they need to be investors or not is kind of like a slightly different question. Um, doctors are a very unique one because they're not sophisticated investors in that like a lot of them have a lot of cash on hand but don't necessarily know the ins and outs of investment and what it means to be an investor. And so you end up kind of educating them on, no, like, I'm going to talk to you once a month, okay? Like, you know, and so you're, you kind of have to educate them on that process. But having them as like, hey, I can go to this person and ask them, like, how, does, how would this work in your practice? You know, how, how would you use this? That has been invaluable. I, I don't even know how to put a dollar figure on that one. And then investors who don't know your business, there's the trade-off of maybe they're a sophisticated investor, so they know... They know in a general sense of how to help you as a startup business. But when it comes times for like, hey, I'm having this issue with a customer and it's in a space that they don't really understand. Um, I, I, I've run into that myself and it, it could be a bit tougher because you end up having to educate them on the space and then saying, okay, now that you have a basic level understanding, how would you help me? Yes. Mm -hmm. But my other question, or my question would be, did your customer change? Um, yeah, so yeah, customer broadened out is probably the best way to say it. So we were hyper-focused on ear, nose, and throat, whereas now basically most specialist physicians, especially those who do like visual, so like ear, nose, throat, dermatology, um, ophthalmology, like we've kind of focused in on those as early adopters. And honestly, dermatology has, has been the one that has picked up the fastest, um, which has been nice for us because it's like the easiest for us to do. So the two kind of went together. What kind of experiment did you make with the early investors on what they shared and all that? So what do you mean by arrangement? Like okay, how much did they did they sum up six hundred thousand dollars? Oh yeah, so so what you do like with convertible debt when someone invests, so con I don't know if people really know what convertible notes are, but um, convertible note is essentially on paper, it is a loan that at a maturity date, so for example, 18 months from the time that they sign, it then converts into shares of your company. So it is a super common vehicle, you know, Silicon Valley, New York, places like that. Um, there's also safes, which are basically convertible notes that don't have maturity dates. So it's just kind of out into the future. Um, so those are actually becoming more common in Silicon Valley, but I, I, I don't understand them well enough. So I don't, I've never used it. Um, but yeah, so when you do a convertible note, there are a set of terms on there. You have the interest rate. So how does it accrue interest over that maturity period? How far out is the maturity date? So you'll see anywhere between like 12 to 24 months usually. Um, does it convert to common stock or preferred stock? Um, valuation cap, which is a more complex concept, but it basically caps the valuation in the future such that if you go past that valuation, they get a bigger discount on future shares. Um, and then there's a discount rate. So if a venture capitalist if a venture capital firm invests in your firm a year from now and they invest at $1 per share, if the convertible note had a 20% discount rate, that convertible note holder will get shares at $0.80 cents per share. And so essentially their loan converts into shares at $0.80 cents per share and that dictates the number of shares they get. So it's, okay. So yeah, I got three minutes, so I have time for a couple more questions. If you have them. What other types of pivots are there besides like the one that you talked about? Yeah, um, that's a good question. 
So I, I guess pivoting can happen a long, a, along a bunch of different dimensions. I mean, you can pivot the customer you're serving. Um, you can actually change the product itself. Um, I mean, yeah, you could do a full on change of the company itself, you know, so um, what's a good one? Slack is a great example, right? Like, I don't know if you guys have ever used Slack, but it's like a communication tool that companies use. Well, Slack was basically a video game company um, where you could like watch people play video games remotely and then they were running out of money and it wasn't working and they changed to a communication platform and have now IPO'd and all types of craziness. So, so yeah, like, I guess depending on where you are regionally, pivoting is much more normal. Um, I found that like in the Midwest, once we pivoted, people were kind of like, oh, you changed, that's crazy. Whereas like I talked to people in the West Coast and it's like, okay, yeah, you know, we're on our fifth pivot, you know, and so it just kind of <laughs> totally depends on where you are. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm trying to think, customer, can you think of any other cue, like other types of pivots? Go-to-market. Go, yeah, your go-to-market strategy. Yes. Yep. Pricing model. Uh, yeah. Yep. Oh, a hundred percent. Yeah, biz business model is actually a big. Yeah, I forgot. That's a big one. Um, oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you guys for your time. I really do appreciate this. Kind of fun.